Welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in this episode of the podcast we have a coaching roundtable with Dave McConey, Steve Hall and myself and we're talking all things nutrition. So Dave has a Bachelor of Exercise Science, he's a coach and an awesome podcast where he donates money on each episode to the guest's charity of choice. So make sure you check out his podcast for part one of this installment and in part one we talk about setting up a new client's diet how we plan dieting phases as well as troubleshooting common challenges our clients and athletes face Uh, in part two we discuss planning specific macro ratios supplementation and optimal body fat to bulk and cut to so Dave and Steve are very intelligent and very experienced coaches who offer plenty of useful information and insights into their practice as as well as mine. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. If you do, be sure to like it and subscribe to the channel and enjoy. I'm glad you also brought up the distinction between, uh, you know, like the physique competitors and people who are just kind of doing this a little bit more casually. Um, Generally speaking, the people I work with you know, I, they might want to get like beach lean, I'll call it maybe like 8% body fat, but not like a true contest lean. Um, and I think it can make a difference there. And, you know, Steve, I want to hear what you think on this too. But um, for me, I rarely tell them they have to hit a certain um, carb or fat number. I usually say a certain calorie number and protein number. And I think that takes care of like 90 to 95% of it. Um, now, you know, kind of touching on what you said before, Jacob, there might be an adherence issue. Maybe somebody who has a higher fat diet, they're you know, more satiated, they can stick to it better or vice versa. So for an individual, it might make a difference. But on the whole, all the data I've seen and even for my own personal results, I haven't seen too much of a difference focusing on carb and fat numbers as long as protein is set and calories are set. Mm-hmm. Cool. So yeah, when I do a diet break with people, um, it depends. So if they are in contest prep and they've really been digging a long period of time, I might be a little bit more just keep fat very low throughout and keep Mm -hmm. your carbohydrates there just because of the fact that that's going to have the biggest impact on their training performance on feeling better sooner and all of these things. And if it's short term, like, I don't know, three days, I wouldn't call a diet break, but if it is a refeed, I definitely prioritize carbohydrates because in the short term, they're going to have the biggest impact. But over a week, I typically say, I, I will either do kind of the protein and calories or if it's someone in contest prep, I'll be like, especially the first few days, really just keep your structure, increase the carbs you've been eating. And then the final mm-hmm. few days, if you feel like you have the psychology to kind of hold on to, like, I don't know, enjoy other things, then feel free to because you probably kind of replenish glycogen stores within those three days and move forward. But if it's latter in prep, then it might be a case of it's kind of like a practice peak week or something. And we are kind of more so using carbohydrates in that way. Yeah, I should clarify, um, if we're talking about a refeed or a diet break, I would emphasize carbs in that case, Um, but just, I meant like more generally speaking. So um, I don't know, any thoughts on that, Jacob? Yeah, totally agree. I think once you've hit a minimum level of fat um, in the context of body composition, there's not much utility in adding protein if somebody's already on a high protein diet um, and therefore you know the increase in carbohydrates um, the increase in calories sorry is going to come from carbohydrates and there is you know some theoretical underpinnings for why that is beneficial as well but again I just think you know if you look to all the three macros it's like well more fat isn't necessarily going to do anything you're already eating high protein where are these calories going to come from so it's carbs um, but again if it's not a contest prep um, I I agree with what uh, Dave was saying in that, you know, you can just set, you know, some protein um, and calorie targets. And again, you can use that as a period to see, uh, you know, what fat and macro, um, you know, intakes a person likes and could potentially stick to and enjoy. Um, You know, if you've had someone on a really low fat diet, high carb diet, and you just say, okay, cool, well, I just want you protein and calories now for the next week. Um, and all of a sudden, they start eating a bit more fat, lower carbs, and they say, hey, I really like this, and I think I could you know, do this moving forward. Can we have more fat? It's like, well, great, let's do that. Um, you know, again, different context uh, than somebody who's getting on stage, um, you know, competing at elite level of powerlifting. But I think, yeah, it's a, it's a cool opportunity to, again, you know, give somebody less specific recommendations to learn about them um, in terms of what they do prefer. Um, but 
obviously, like I mentioned earlier, this is going to come after periods where you've given them, you know, some pretty specific, um, you know, guidelines uh, to make sure that they are achieving the, the goal. Awesome. Uh, and you mentioned that before on that pyramid, you mentioned the top of it was supplementation. And that's one thing we were going to talk about, just our approach to supplementation. And um, I actually don't know your thoughts, either of your thoughts on supplementation. So we might disagree. Um, for me, the more... Steroids, clenbuterol, <laughs> you know, gut growth hormone, all of it. Whatever you can get it in there, whatever, however many ass cheeks you can stab, do it. <laughs> Anything that's under the table at GNC basically is my approach. It's so, getting late. In, it's getting late in the evening, and you guys know full well what happens. <laughs> the true Jacob comes out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for me, at least, um, and I, yeah, I just had that podcast with Eric Trexler, and he obviously has done a lot of work with supplements. Um, it seems to me that the more time you know we do research, the more we see that not that many supplements are really useful. Um, I think caffeine can be really helpful for people who are in contest prep just to get through their workouts and, and kind of get through life during that time. Um, creatine, I've never noticed anything from any creatine that I've used, but obviously there's a ton of research on it. And so I still tell clients if they want to try it, give it a shot and see how it works for you. Um, some research on beta alanine and citrulline malate is promising, but I'm not too big of a supplement guy personally. Um, so what do you guys think? Shall I start? I'll, I'll give it a crack. So Jacob's already given all his supplement recommendations already, so it's all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I definitely wanted to touch on this because at least for the population I work with, again, who are like potentially coaches themselves, they're being kind of um, open to all of these things. And we are more so potentially looking at a lot of the time the, the top of the pyramid because we have all of the basics settled all the time. So loads of supplements coming out like every other week, like a really sexy. And I think it's funny because even people who are very novice, who don't even know the pyramid, they're focusing on the top as well. So it's funny that kind of the people at the extremes end up focusing there. And I think in both scenarios is actually the wrong thing. Because I think a lot of people who are more advanced need to actually take care of some of the things below a little bit more. And they're kind of jumping the gun a little bit. And I'm very much the same as you, Dave. I definitely under emphasize supplements because when we really look at it, kind of when you're looking at a percentage of the result, the outcome to our complete and utter results is what, 5% or less. And the number of supplements that actually do anything is kind of very minimal. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize with a supplement kind of market is it's kind of completely unregulated. Like you can come out with a supplement probably yourself like any time because the regulations are just so low. And that's really like damaging. And there's a lot of people JPS who are... are actually manufacturing a supplement. I'm not even kidding. Oh, really? <laughs> We're putting together some protein, yeah. Ooh, it better taste good. What's the flavor? It's going to be something Australian. Vegemite. Vegemite flavor. <laughs> That's what I was No, thinking. but it's like super easy. Like you don't even need to do anything to, like there's no legal requirements whatsoever. I couldn't believe how easy it was to yeah. do. Well, it's shocking. And I think there's people who are, I mean, like Jacob's coming out of his supplement, which is great because Jacob's going to do a proper supplement. But there's people who are, making money producing bollock supplements from all these people and they're advanced generally they're big jack people who are very advanced they can get away with look i take this it gets results it's like the other day i was walking through westfield supermarket uh supermarket um mall and there was um cristiano ronaldo selling like well he wasn't there but his like <laughs> ab thing where you put it on your abs and it gave him his abs apparently and it's just ridiculous kind of how unregulated and how easy it is to fool people when you have someone in great shape saying this product does something for them. And when you remind yourself that it's providing less than 5% anyway, then you can kind of almost rule out. So I always like to remind people of the fact that it's such a minimal thing. There's so many poor supplements out there and it's really unregulated. And then when you, I do, and I'm really careful to recommend supplements and it's only ones where there's like reviews, meta-analysis that have come out because that's actually shown the sufficient data to actually even do such a thing. Whereas lots of these ones that are coming out like the um, Miguel's recently done the article on like CBD, which was like huge. And he was going through it. And initially he was like, there's not actually enough data to really do much, but more came out and he ended up doing it. The same with like glucose disposal agents, they became huge. And reality, there's so, most of the data out there is really poor. So the people who are like proposing these are either being ignorant to the research and they're not really looking into it and they're being sponsored. And so they're just taking it and then giving it out to people and saying it's kind of making all the difference because use my affiliate code and stuff like this. Or um, they're kind of 
using just their personal anecdote, which is fine, but I just think it needs to be honest. And that's what it needs to be. It's like uh, I hadn't looked into the research into blue light blockers before. I was like, I'm using these flipping orange shades. Are they doing anything? I looked into the research. There's there's all research into them. Really nothing. So it's all. Do you still use them? I still use them. Yeah. (laughs) I think. Well, Sebo's real, baby. (laughs) Sebo works. Works. But the, the thing is. I would be very honest about kind of saying I use them. The evidence isn't necessarily there, but see, they're cheap. They're not going to cause any harm. It's like something like that. So with supplementation, I'm very much like, does it fit your budget? Are there many pros? Do the pros outweigh the possible cons there could be? Because a lot of people don't think about the possible cons. If there's not much research out yet, it could eventually show that there's more negatives and then go for it. And if for me, if there's not ample research, I'm not going to recommend it. I'm probably not going to take it, but sometimes I might kind of try some things but uh, yeah, that's the way I tend to go. And like you, Dave, creatine, vitamin D3, most people in the UK need that. Most people in Europe need it. Um, caffeine, obviously. So I do sometimes look into people's caffeine intake, potentially periodizing that, especially like if I'm seeing people taking like pre-workouts during deloads, I'm saying, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's definitely not something they need to be doing. Um, sometimes I like will recommend potentially magnesium, zinc. These are some things that generally athletes are low in anyway. Um, and that's pretty much it. And otherwise, more outside of that, I might look into blood work. But really, those are the basics that I tend to run with. Yeah, I mean, and like Jacob said, the placebo effect is a huge factor because it's not that everybody is dishonest. I mean, certainly there are people who it's very obvious that they are lying, right? They're just straight up lying about the results. Um, but a lot of people just genuinely believe it. Um, and this happens in medicine, too. There is a term regression to the mean, which, like it sounds, it's basically just people going back to their norm. And so you have people who, you know, they feel really bad. They go do, you know, some ridiculous treatment. And then they just naturally happen to get back to their average. And they think, oh, it worked. And you see people who take supplements. Maybe they just had a good workout or they just really believed it was going to work. And so then they tell everybody else, well, it's so great. Um, and so it just kind of gets, you know, cycled over and over. Um, and it's, it's definitely a problem. And really the only thing I've found I can do is just point people to the research because if somebody really strongly believes somebody or something, it, it's kind of hard to convince them otherwise. Um, so Jacob, aside from trend, clen and your spike <laughs> new, uh, protein, what do you recommend? <laughs> yes, we spike our protein with amphetamines guys. You will get hooked. Um, <laughs> no. Um, cool. So Steve perfectly laid the foundation for my general thoughts around supplementation. It's like we need some pretty good evidence to suggest that it works before I will even consider it. Um, but with my approach with supplements after, you know, I've obviously, um, you know, looked at the research is to, you know, run a basic cost to benefit ratio. Um, you know, does the, the benefit of the potential, you know, benefit, you know, the five cents Steve was talking about, um, exceed not just the financial cost, um, you know, but the cost of investment in that supplement um, at the expense of other things, such as good food, um, you know, spending more money on, you know, personal training sessions, for example, buying a book. Um, so, so I do kind of weigh these things up and have that discussion with my clients. Um, but then generally from there after a cost of benefit analysis um, you know, is very much context and individual specific. So for the general population uh, client that I work with or lifting enthusiast, someone who's not super serious, not super lean or at extreme ends of um, you know, the, the realms of what's possible in terms of body comp and performance, um, unless there's a known deficiency as identified you know, via proper testing, um, you know, I, I will recommend that they supplement with that. Um, and obviously, hopefully, their doctor has done that in the first place. You know, for example, like iron deficiencies in females. Um, but uh, again, when I start to recommend general health supplement, I think it's important first before we go further. Um, you know, we have ergogenic aids, so things that improve performance, and we have general health supplements. Um, so, in terms of the general health supplements, um, when total calorie intake and body fat percentage, uh, you know, getting low or their specific dietary requirements to require the elimination of food or food groups. So, for example, vegans, somebody might be intolerant to something. Or sort of stuff. Um, that's what I might start to recommend a supplement, a supplement for somebody. So, you know, leaner individuals on really low calories won't be consuming much food at all. And therefore, you know, their micronutrient intake is going to be pretty low. So I may recommend a, a multivitamin. Who knows, but it's like, well, at least we're, we're trying to do something here. Um, you know, uh, 
that's that's one uh, situation. Um, and then, as I've mentioned, you know, if somebody's a vegan, they're not going to be eating much meat, which means they'll potentially be iron deficient. If somebody doesn't eat fish, you know, I recommend uh, a fish oil if they're okay uh, in doing so. And like Steve said, um, you know, if somebody is deficient or they're not consuming in their diet, um, you know, much calcium and things like this, um, I'll recommend that also. And again, vitamin D3 to those who, you know, maybe a little bit more prone to, you know, SAD, so seasonal, um, you know, depression, um, you know, when there's lack of sun exposure, things like that, um, you know, potentially. Now, in terms of the ergogenic aids, um, yeah, very much in line with what you guys said. It's like creatine, if they want to, it's pretty cheap. Most people, um, you know, can afford it. And if they ask the question, I'll say, yeah, sure, let's do it. Um, caffeine. You guys know that I'm pretty much a stimulant junkie, so um, you know I, I don't you know taper my caffeine ever. It's like a thousand milligrams a day, three six five, bro. Um, Steve's like, no, yeah, that. Um, wait till wait till we hang out, Steve. You're gonna be like Jake psycho. Um, but I have a really I'm gonna put my coach's hat on now and use a really uh, I guess abstract out of the box way to use a pre workout. Um, I found that. Recommending people to take pre-workout, um, for example, immediately after when they wake up, if they're training in the mornings, or immediately after work, if they're training in the evenings, is a great way to develop the habit of just going to the gym because nobody's going to take a pre-workout. I don't feel like training now. I'm just going to go home and sit on the couch. Um, so I found that recommending pre-workouts, or you know, at the very least. Uh, caffeine. I think pre-workouts are probably a more potent influence on people's behavior because it's like, well, I've had a pre-workout now, not just a coffee. It's a freaking pre-workout. They start getting tingles. They're like, oh, fuck, I've got to go to the gym. Um, it would be a great way to you know, develop some, some good behaviors around training. So I don't mind using it uh, in that sense. I hope none of my clients are, are going to listen to this because um, they'll be like, oh, <laughs> the fuck, I, know what he, I know what he's doing now. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, that's the beauty of coaching is that often we don't need to always recommend things that are going to have a direct benefit. Um, in the case that of the pre-workout, for example, it may improve their performance. That's why you take the pre-workout. But there are indirect benefits um, you know, to supplementation sometimes. For example, if somebody takes a multivitamin or a fish oil and they think, fuck, I'm being healthy today. This is going to be a healthy day. And that changes their perspective of how they're going to consume the foods within their diet for that day. Who's to say stop taking multivitamin? It's, it's not proven to you know, have any meaningful benefit to your overall health when you're eating at a calorie surplus or you know, you're overweight and your blood markers, your you know, insulin levels are through the roof, all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, if that is the catalyst for somebody to you know, reframe uh, you know, their mindset for the day and to think that they're, they're being healthier um, and then they're more likely to go exercise and eat well because they've had this supplement, I think that's that's worth it um, for me. Um, and I will, you know, it, it's hard to, to obviously know these things because, you know, we're, we're dealing with humans, not, um, you know, data here. Um, it's very... You know, vague and ambiguous as to how much of an effect it has on someone, whether it will work or not. Um, but if you have a discussion with someone and they say, you know, when I take my multivitamin in the morning, there are the days that you know I, I go for a walk and you know I, I don't eat out, I prepare my food. It's like, well, you know, if that's something that's helping them, you know, <laughs> then then just because science says it, it's not, you know effective, then you, you don't need to always be effective. Um, you know, there's indirect benefits, like I said. <clears throat> Yeah, totally. Um, it's funny what you said about the the pre workout because I just heard Eric Trexler say the same thing. He would, if, like, he was contest prep and he would take a pre workout because then he's like, well, I just spent a dollar basically on this, and what am I going to do with this four hundred milligrams of caffeine going through my veins? So you got to go work out. Um, so it's an interesting trick. Yeah. The only thing I wanted to add is um, I just want to make sure in case anyone's thinking, oh, Steve doesn't recommend this. Omega threes that Jacob said, I'd also, if people aren't eating fatty fish, that's one of the ones kind of like mm -hmm. a, a no brainer. Um, and it's funny, it's kind of like the blue light blockers. Like how, the dare you, how dare you miss something, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be called out. <laughs> um, so the the blue light blockers is for a lot of people. Yeah. It's just like you put them on, you relax, you start feeling a little bit sleepy, placebo or not, kind of just starts that kind of good sleep hygiene pattern. 
Yep, yep. Yeah. So uh, last just question. Just put sunglasses on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, last question I want to get to was um, just talking, I mean, it's, it's related to nutrition kind of, um, just in terms of bulking and cutting to different body fats. Um, you know, obviously it's very popular on social media to try to stay really lean year round. Um, and then I just, just made a video recently talking about this whole like bear mode concept and going to higher body fats. So, um, for me personally, I, I feel better a little bit higher in body fat, not like obviously fat, but you know, like 15 plus. And, you know, I was, I was fat when I was a kid. It's I definitely naturally, um, just kind of gravitate towards that 15% range or so. Um, and I, I noticed some pretty huge differences when I get around there in terms of like much higher libido, um, better energy, just better workouts. So I don't typically try to keep people very lean, um, but obviously it's individual. So for your clients, do you guys just kind of go on how they're feeling or do you have specific percentages, you know, visual, obviously that you're trying to get them up to? So I think, um, yeah, it's really interesting to see the back and forth over the bear mode and different people having their kind of their perspective on it. And it's something I wanted to do something like a post on potentially because they, I forget the study now that they, that Eric Helms always brings up, but it's so funny because there's really limited data on it, like mm -hmm. really limited data. There's basically this, I think it's by Garth, like this one study. And even that study is not specific towards a population where someone's specifically training for hypertrophy everything is like dedicated nutrient timing like they got everything on point so i find it difficult to recommend via that study because you have to kind of look at the people they were doing other sports as well they weren't specifically hypertrophy and all of this so i i, I remember when 3dmj came over for their london seminar years ago i even pulled eric up on it i was like but these guys i just don't i'm just not sure about it and i think it's because i got personally shot in the ass by maintaining potentially too lean, really shooting for a low gaining rate. And I just saw no results with it. And it was really disheartening, to be honest. I say no results. I saw some, but this off season for me has been the best ever. And I've just kind of been a little bit more assertive, a little bit more open to gaining a little bit more body fat, a little bit more weight, a bit more clearly. And I don't know whether or not it's the fact I've just let that happen and I've been more open to it and it's made me driven towards a specific goal. So I've had that. But I found the same to be true for a lot of my clients, where if we're just a little bit more like, oh, if we gain like a little bit more assertive, like one to two percent a month, then people are just more like, yeah, like I have to be on my training. I have to like make everything as on point as possible. Whereas I think the low slow burner approach kind of people are a bit kind of I don't know if they're just less kind of um, with it. And that might be why I don't see as good results that way. But it's just an interesting discussion. So in terms of keeping people's body fat, if people are trying to compete like within a short period of time, then I definitely plan backwards from that, have an idea of how far away from stage are they getting just to make sure that they're not getting out of that realm and that they're kind of having to cut down like 30, 40 pounds in one go and it's kind of extreme. That'd be a horrible approach. For people generally just in their off seasons for a long period of time, it's very much of a case of uh, having an awareness of what their body composition, composition is. So if they're looking okay, they're feeling really good, performance is really good, then I'm very happy to mostly keep going. Um, and for like you said, Dave, some people feel pretty good, quite lean. Other people feel better with a bit more body fat. And then there's also just personal preference in terms of where you sit. For me personally, like I've maintained probably below 15, closer to 10% for a long period of time. And I feel fine. Um, and I, now I'm probably, don't know, 15, 16% or something. And again, I, I feel fine in that range. I think I'm pretty good. If I probably, if I go much higher than I am now, I can kind of see some of the downsides coming in. Um, if I go lower than 10%, like definitely things are not looking good. And I think generally for me, like around that 15% is actually good. Um, and I think people generally, are a little bit more performance focused when they are a little bit less lean. And so it kind of works in their favor in that regard anyway, because when you're on the leaner side, you're always kind of looking for your abs. But once they're kind of gone, once things look a bit softer, you kind of accept it a little bit more. And then you're like, yeah. oh, I have to make sure I'm performing well in the gym. Again, I think there's a crazy amount of psycholo psychology involved with gaining uh, that people don't appreciate. And I think that's sometimes what I've managed to kind of get into with a lot of my clients who have seen me go through periods of time where I haven't accepted kind of the fat gain. I made kind of the uh, videos and blog posts on adipose phobia. And I think there's a lot of people that are like that. And I think it does stem from an element of people trying to shoot for the recomposition, to try and shoot for the really slowly gaining approach sometimes. I think sometimes people go through their off seasons 
seeking to gain the least amount of fat when in reality I'm all about seeking to gain the maximum amount of muscle and I think that's a stronger mindset and a more positive mindset for someone in their off season so that's where I tend to shoot for people and um, obviously females would be roughly 10% above that females always get left out but I don't want to make them feel like they are <laughs> sure Jacob yeah I Steve brought up a lot of really good points so when I'm determining what the upper limit is for an individual in terms of their body fat, um, it's important to remember their, their starting point. So if somebody is already overweight, um, you know, and they're a pretty high body fat percentage and they have, you know, physique goals, whether it be, you know, just getting, you know, getting on stage, um, you know, getting them into a range where, you know, they, their body comes at a place where, um, yeah, they can maintain it pretty well uh, without too many side effects, um, you know, such as you know, poor energy, you know, a lot of dietary fatigue, you know, food focus, hunger, all those sorts of things. And I think once you get them to that position, um, then you can start to see what the best uh, body fat percentage is for them to build muscle. Um, because I really don't like percentages um, because I think it's, it's so individual in terms of where somebody sits. Um, in terms of that optimal range to build muscle. Um, but what you should be monitoring is predictable and reliable performance and recovery because you know, we need to remember that to build muscle, you know, resistance training is the most potent stimulus to do so. Uh, so we need to be able to you know, be in a position you know, with our body composition um, to maximize you know, progressive tension overload, right? Um, because that's what's going to build muscle. Um, now, having said that, we also need to take into consideration, you know, the individual's level of advancement, um, you know, as it relates to uh, not just their, their tenure lifting, um, you know, but their genetic potential, you know, for muscle gain. So if somebody's right at, you know, the beginner stages of their career, you know, they're just starting out, they're going to be able to gain, you know, quite a bit of muscle. So, you know, can, worrying about, you know, their body fat percentage really irrelevant you know at that point it's like you know get them training properly um you know get them eating sufficient amount of food you know whether it's maintenance um you know slightly above um and just you know let them train and they'll, they'll build an appreciable amount of muscle um but for, for someone who's more advanced i think there's you know two divergent approaches um you know such as the bear mode um, where, you know, for advanced athletes, it's like you really need to go, you know, balls deep in terms of gaining body fat to build muscle. And then you have, you know, the other pr approach where it's like, well, advanced athletes, um, you know, can't build as much muscle, therefore they should have a, a relatively small surplus. Um, and I think that, you know, both have merits um, and which one is best, I'm not really sure. But again, it comes down to can you predictably perform at a, at a high level in the gym and reliably you know, perform at that level as well as recover you know, at an appropriate rate. Um, and I'm sure you could do do that at, um, you know, both the, the lower ends of, you know, um, the surplus or the size of the surplus um, and body fat percentages being, you know, towards the lower end of what somebody, um, you know, wants to hold or should be holding, you know, for, for Steve, for example, you know, if it might be like the 12%, I'm sure he could, he could still build an appreciable amount of muscle there. Um, you know, but again, you know, if you go into the bear mode, it's like up to say 15, 16% for Steve, um, and you start really pushing things that end, it's like, well, that's might be where he's most predictable and reliable. Um, you know, for somebody else, they could still see the same amount of uh, reliability in their performance and recovery at 12%. Um, and again, training is what will drive, you know, muscle, muscle growth. It's what's going to, you know, lead to all the, you know, anabolic signaling, um, and nutrition simply augments that, um, is it worth safeguarding that and, you know, having, uh, you know, higher, a bigger or smaller deficit? It's probably a good idea to have a, you know, faster rate of gain. Um, but at the same time, when you gain so quickly, it can be really difficult um, to determine whether or not you're actually gaining muscle um, because you, know, you could spend all this time, you know, gaining weight and, yes, you're looking bigger and bigger and, uh, you know, you're, you're scale weights climbing, but it can be difficult to determine whether or not um, you've built tissue in the right areas. Um, so in terms of like b managing body composition over the long term for my clients, it's really a case of when we're trying to build muscle, 
find a body fat percentage that you you feel good at and you can train hard and recover at predictably and reliably um and then you know the rate of gain will really be dependent on uh you know where they're at in terms of their level of advancement uh, as it relates to their genetic potential um you know if somebody's gaining like two percent of body weight per month um you know or even more and they're an advanced athlete it's like well really um and if they're at a higher end of their you know um you know body fat settling range um that's probably not going to be too productive um you know outside of that range um but if someone's a beginner you know, you could definitely gain 2% or more uh, percent of body weight per month. Um, and you could definitely, like, push them up to higher ends of, um, you know, their body fat uh, percentages because I don't think that it's, uh, you know, all that weight is necessarily going to be too problematic down the track. And you are trying to find out where do they where do they fit best, um, you know, with their body fat in terms of being able to train hard in the off-season. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answered that question, but... Uh, yeah, it's one of those things where people get so caught up on these numbers. It's like, you know, you can't get above X percentage because, you know, your P ratio and all this kind of stuff. And it's, I don't think that, you know, in a practical setting, we need to be worrying about that. Um, again, we don't have much evidence, if any, to really support that. A lot of it is, you know, theoretical um, and, you know, just people hypothesizing, you know, based on, you know, understanding of physiology um, and we don't know how that plays out you know when you throw in um, you know training hard and trying to build muscle over longer durations it's like you know we're, we're really zooming in looking at um, you know the body in a vacuum in this sense um, so so yeah I think just in the off season we're trying to build muscle just get at a body fat percentage that you are happy at you know in t and that means a lot of different things for a lot of different people it could be visually it could be performance uh, it could be lifestyle um you know it could be the, just their relationship with food if you're a body fat percentage and you are feeling great um you know about how you uh, focus on food and the behaviors and the psychology around food then just stay there who cares if it's a little bit higher or it's a you know whatever it is that's going to be beneficial down the track um, because if you're at a body fat percentage that is, you know, too low and all you think about is food, you're trying to gain at a slower rate, that's problematic too. And if, again, you, you gain so quick, you're like there's so many different scenarios. If you gain so quick and you're at a body fat percentage that, you know, potentially just makes you less motivated to train because you, know, you feel crap or you're sluggish and all this sort of stuff, um, then – maybe that's not the right body fat percentage for you to sit at in, in a bulking phase. Um, and in terms of like, you know, the lower end of, um, what was the other part of the question? It was asking about like um, the, the optimal range to cut down to. Was that right? Mm. Dave? Yeah. 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 It's like, how, how does someone answer that? Yeah. And of course, like, if you're, if you're competing, you, you know, you yeah. have to. Um, like competing, it's lifestyle. like you literally don't want, you know, an ounce of body fat on your body, so you do whatever you can to get there. Um, but outside of that, it's like, well, are you a photo, you sort of scale back across like, you know, a spectrum of goals. It's like physique competitors, well, you don't have a choice. Get as lean as possible for your specific division. Then you've got, you know, say models, where it's like, okay, you need to get lean enough that meets the requirements of, you know, the magazine, the website, or the photographer, their, their rep, you know, what they want you to look like, um, you know, that gets you the work. And obviously that's important because it's probably your career at that point. And you scale back from there. It's like, okay, somebody has, you know, they want to go to the beach and look lean and they have, you know, their wedding and things like that. And it's like, well, we can look at all these different scenarios. And, you know, I think the body fat percentage, you know, range in terms of cutting, it's like, well, how are we measuring this in the first place? You know, we all know that DEXA scans can have, you know, quite a degree of, uh, you know, variation in terms of how accurate they are. Um, and yeah, I think just on a pragmatic level, it's like get to a point that, that meets your goals um, sure. and then gain to a point that you feel comfortable at and you can make progress in. Yeah. And the only, I mean, I agree with all that. And the only thing I would add um, is just that I think in general, for me at least, when I've tried, and I think kind of a similar problem as Steve, when you try to stay too lean, it just, for whatever reason, I don't know if we know physiologically why, but it seems that when people try to do these shorter phases, it just doesn't work as well. Um, and like I said, I don't know exactly why, but I know at one point I was thinking, well, if I'm bulking up from 8% to 16%, 
why don't I just do a bunch of smaller cycles of bulking up from eight to 10% and then I'll just go back down. But overall it'll be the same. And it just didn't, I, I really went like a year without gaining anything like netting anything. And then I'll after just, that, I go ahead. Sorry, man. Sorry. You continue. Um, you know, I went on the other extreme and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do a huge bulk. And I gained like 30 pounds in like a little over a year. And that was probably ridiculous. But when I cut down, man, I netted like eight pounds of muscle from that. Um, so again, I don't know why physiologically there just seems to be this need to hold on to it for some period of time, but in my mm -hmm. experience and the people I've trained, it just seems to. So, um, I would definitely caution people about really just trying to stay too lean if, if that's not where your body naturally wants to be at. Two things on that that I'm going to say is if you want to build muscle, body fat percentages are, and improve your body comp over time. The body fat percentage, you know, arguments I really feel becomes um, you know, irrelevant when you frame the long term objective differently, as opposed to you know wanting to be a certain body fat percentage, um, you know, for X goal. People should instead focus on being at a certain body fat percentage at a certain weight. And if your goal is long-term body composition improvement, if your scale weight is increasing over time and you're within a certain body fat percentage, um, you know, at these specific points in, in as the weight increases, then chances are you've built muscle. So something I focus on with my guys in the off season is not necessarily where their body fat percentage gets to, rather it's over the course of longer periods what do you look like at a certain uh, body weight? So we will look at someone who's say 80 kilos and they're you know 12 percent body fat. You know they might go through various bulking and cutting cycles. Again, you just got to work out you know what works best for you. They might go through various you know massing and cutting phases over the course of two years. And if they're at 83 kilos at 12 percent body fat, it's like well that's job done. Um, and there's many approaches within those, you know, two time points that you can take. Um, and my second point, like Dave mentioned, is that I have seen a lot of success with extended periods of calorie surplus, pushing the higher ends of body fat percentage for me as well as my clients. And I think anecdotally, you look at any natural pro, they've done a dirty bulk. They might flip their, their opinion in terms of what the optimal approach is, but at one point in their career, they gained a shit ton of weight really fast and they, you know, went down that route of, you know, rapid gaining. And I, I think there's something to be said for that. You know, you look at a lot of the, you know, natural pros such as, you know, Alberto Nunes, you look at guys like Brian Whitaker. All these people have done a phase where they've, they've done the dirty bulk. You know, they got really, really heavy. Uh, body fat percentage probably exceeded what they would be comfortable, um, you know, being at now in their off season. And it paid huge dividends, you know, in their subsequent uh, seasons. So, yeah, I think at one point in your career, it's probably a good idea to to push the limits and see, um, you know, how much you can get out of that, that approach. Um, and then I think once you've sort of got to the end of your uh, – you know, your muscle gaining potential when things are really slowing down, um, you know, you make the call as to how much you want to, you know, build muscle. And then, you know, you can either go the slow route and just sort of tick along over time um, or you really push it and try to, you know, get heavy again and see if that, that works for you. But I, I don't, again, I don't think anyone can really, like Steve said, there's not a lot of research on this. Um, you know, so we don't, we don't know, we've just got to figure it out. And there's so much context involved in this, you know, psychology as well as, you know, timeframes between competition that it's really hard to say it's, you know, with, with any degree of certainty, this is better than that. Awesome. So Steve, while I'd love to get your opinion on all of that, um, my battery's at like 3%. Oh and no. A, <laughs> yeah. And I have a patient in like five minutes. So, uh, crap, my two we'll, points is fine. <laughs> Uh, well, we can uh, we can touch on that when we do our part three, maybe, and then go into training from there. Um, okay. But yeah, so I'm Dave McConey from Brains and Gains. You can see me on Instagram at Dave underscore McConey. Uh, where can people find you guys? So I'm over at Revive Stronger. Um, any social media platform, that'd be brilliant. So cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Jacob. I'm in Australia, so forget about me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I'm off the grid. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> no, JPS, and that's about it. Thanks for having us on, Dave. No problem, guys.